Hey everybody, it's Jim here and I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm going to be making the case for why you should consider a Paul Reed Smith McCarty and adding it into your arsenal of guitars or making it your main guitar. As you may have noticed, if you have watched other installments of this little mini series that I do, there is going to be some playing in this, mainly at the beginning that you just saw. And at the end, I'm gonna do a little bit of outro. However, I am gonna be mostly talking about this guitar. If you're interested in a full on demo of this instrument, I'm gonna leave a link right up here. Have at it if you will, but let's get started. Now, over the last few years, there's been a resurgence in the McCarty line itself, but it actually doesn't have to do with this model. It has to do with the 594 that was recently released. And a lot of people tend to gravitate towards that because it's a little bit closer in spec to a Gibson style instrument as the 594 would imply. In case you're not sure, that has to do with the scale length of the guitar itself. It's 24.594. Gibson's is 24 and three quarters. This one falls kind of in between a Fender and the Gibson at 25, which is the standard Paul Reed Smith scale length for the majority of their models. And the 594s became such popular guitars that Paul even added them to the S2 line of guitars, meaning people that didn't want or have the money to spend on a core model would have a much more affordable version of it, whereas the regular McCarty, that has never been an option. Now at this point in the video, you might be thinking to yourself, why do I keep talking about the McCarty 594 if this is supposed to be about the standard McCarty and if it's such a great guitar, why didn't I buy one of those instead of the standard model? Well, I think part of the reason has to do with the fact that a lot of people that chase tones and certain kind of vintage vibes, they're always going to want something that leans a little bit more towards a brand like Gibson. Let's just call it what it is. And when you change the scale length to a more Gibson kind of size here, it kind of takes away some of the principal characters that I like the most about Paul Reed Smith guitars. This is not a knock against the 594, but when I was ready to purchase one of their core models, I wanted something that was straight up Paul Reed Smith. And to me, this guitar, I would say, it's gonna sound crazy, is their Telecaster. Now, there are a few reasons why I say that. The first being, this guitar is pure PRS in my book. The 25 inch scale length standard, the 10 inch radius on it. You have very, very basic controls akin to a Telecaster. Granted, this does have the coil split available to it and just the regular wraparound bridge. This guitar, even if it didn't do the coil splits, I would say it's still my favorite out of all of them. And that goes with knowing how good the coil splits are on this instrument. This guitar is just straight to the point. Whereas with a 594, you do have, again, a Gibson styled layout, if you will call it that, of one volume per each pickup and one tone for each pickup. And when you introduce coil splitting, there are a few little tricks that you can do that are pretty cool, but I just, I enjoy this really streamlined approach. Now, outside of the streamlined design, another reason that this guitar reminds me of a Tele is because of how stable it is. This isn't specific to the PRS McCarty itself in the line of Paul Reed Smith's family of products, but because you don't have a vibrato and you do have the string angle almost sh directly straight through going through the tuners, you're not going to have the same kind of tuning problems potentially from other brands where the strings kind of angle outwards out of the nut itself. And just like a good Telecaster, it is almost impossible to get a bad sound out of this guitar in my book. Now, as far as the playability goes, you're buying these at a core level. So it's gonna be top notch as far as the quality control and the craftsmanship goes, unless you get somebody who really abused one of these things used. But outside of that, it's a really lightweight instrument without being a feather. This one's a little bit over seven pounds on it. You get the double cutaway. You do not have an option to have a single cut version as you do with the 594, but it kind of makes sense why they would include that on the 594 because again, it's going after a very specific kind of guitar player who may or may not like a less Paul styled instrument. And one advantage this guitar does have over a Gibson Les Paul, if this matters to you and you play leads or somebody who plays ambience higher up the neck, you have superior upper fret access on this compared to one of those guitars. So this guitar sounds incredible. It plays flawlessly. The build quality that you're gonna get from a Paul Reed Smith core level instrument is as good as you're going to find on any guitar, in my opinion. It's light, it's comfortable. What's not to love about this then? Well, I can only really think of two cons. First being, might not be a con to you, but you have to purchase this as a core model. As I said early on in this video, there is no SE, 
There is no S2. There is only core when it comes to the actual McCarty standards. So if you're buying them new, yeah, it can get expensive. It can get expensive quick. If you want a 10 top or, you know, a fancy finish like this in general, it's going to run you well over $3,000 most of the time. But if you're somebody that doesn't mind playing one of these things used, you can get really good deals on this. We're talking about less than a new CE24. And that's not so bad at that point. If you could find one of these in a finish like, you know, the McCarty Burst, ironically enough, that would be a really good one, or an Amber. I've seen those from $2,000 to $2,200 sell pretty quickly within the last week and a half. And the only other potential con of this guitar that I can think of outside of the price has to be the fact that when you buy a core, depending on your color choice, it might be very prone to fading and eventually turn into a color that resembles nothing like what you purchased it new as. If the guitar you like is blue or it happens to have a shade of blue in it, uh, purple has some blue base coats to it. What eventually will happen with the purple finish, for example, it will turn into a raspberry. This is well known if the guitar is left out and exposed to direct sunlight or even just lighting from your room, something like this, where there's not the sun beating down on it, but after a few years, it's going to fade. It's just how these dyes work, unfortunately. But if you're somebody that doesn't mind leaving your guitar in its case when you're done with it, like I do with this one, you're going to greatly reduce how long it will take for the color to fade. But I think it must be said, if outside of price, the only other con I could think of with this guitar would be its potential of fading depending on the color that you want. I mean, that speaks volumes to just how good this guitar is overall outside of that. Absolutely nothing else to complain about. If you found this video helpful or you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like, leave me a comment, let me know what you think about McCarty's, or let me know what your favorite model of Paul Reed Smith instrument is if the McCarty is not yours. I know I'm in the minority with that. However, that's all I have for you today. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video. Take it easy. Thank <laughs> you.